So hi everybody, today I'd like to present to you my PhD thesis work on taking inspiration from expert creative practice to design crowdsourcing techniques for supporting creativity. Ooh. Platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk and others have made it possible for hundreds of people to come together to produce creative work at massive scale. Projects like the Johnny Cash Project ask workers to draw individual frames uh, which were combined to create a reinterpretation of a music video while other past work has looked at how to achieve more complex projects by building workflows that allow crowd workers to build on each other's work. Oops. Um, so doing this makes a whole lot of sense because it's this breaking down of work into independent parts that allows crowdsourcing to be so good at achieving large complex tasks quickly and at scale. And currently crowds use a number of proven strategies to split up this work. So in many crowdsourcing systems, individual workers are encouraged to submit independent submissions that may net them a monetary bonus or a benefit of some kind if it's ultimately selected. Other systems divide the work into smaller chunks, assigning them to workers with the intent of merging work together at the end. So the Johnny Cash project is an example of this, as are projects like Galaxy Zoo, Foldit, and other uh, uh, tasks where a large amount of repetitive work like data collection or labeling needs to be done. And more recently, systems have explored more complex workflow styles that resemble uh, an assembly line. Uh, Soylent, for example, proposed a workflow pattern, pattern called Find, Fix, Verify, indicating three different tasks that could be done by different workers in that order to together perform the task of copy editing text. Um, research has even looked at how to get the crowd to create their own workflows based on uh, given goals. So all of these strategies requires predetermining uh, a particular desired outcome and prescribing to crowds exactly how to create that outcome. Uh, this usually means that using these strategies, crowd workers work very independently. Any connection between workers is usually in the form of work being passed from one worker to another, and this limits the kind of work that we can crowdsource. So to compare, how do experts manage themselves when they create stuff? Uh, the creative processes that expert creators already use may be an untapped a source of reliable creative strategies that may help us understand how the crowd can influence the direction of complex creative projects. So we know, for example, that experts continually create and revise constraints to develop purpose for their work. They reflect during practice, uh, and they make use of existing patterns for solutions rather than reinventing the wheel. So in other words, no expert creator simply competes and votes with themselves. Um, they may create alternative solutions to a problem, uh, but rather than taking a solution wholesale, as you might see in a crowdsourcing system, experts often combine or modify solutions by taking the bigger picture into account, and can even make the judgment call to start over and try a new approach. So what if we could get the crowd to also thoughtfully revise their work as they work? Um, if we can do that, we might be able to expand the ability of crowdsourcing to tackle even more complex collaborative projects. Uh, my research focuses on adapting expert creative practice into social computing and crowdsourcing environments in order to make these strategies accessible to a crowd of non-experts. That is, rather than breaking down work by splitting it into independent steps, maybe we should enable the crowd to follow a process that looks more like uh, an expert. Instead of doing creative crowdsourcing like crowdsourcing, maybe we can do creative crowdsourcing like creativity. So in this talk, I'll talk about three expert practices that I've been exploring through several projects. Uh, first, I'll talk about Ensemble, where I explored how leader-created constraints can help a crowd coordinate in writing short fiction stories. Then I'll talk about Mechanical Novel, where I looked at how to get the crowd to engage in reflection and revision on their own, uh, where over 200 unique workers were able to work together to write short fiction without a leader. And lastly, I'll talk about Mosaic, where I looked at how to design online creative communities so that they focus not just on showing off final successes, but on helping creators support each other while they work, uh, and show how we were able to build up a community of creators that shared their creative processes with each other. So first, Ensemble. Um, for this project, we looked at the expert practice of creating and revising constraints. Um, so in Ensemble, we structure crowd work around these constraints rather than a specific overall goal. So most of us are familiar with examples of how the crowd can produce incredible pieces of collaborative work. Um, but though the web has been able to create the great collaborative encyclopedia, it hasn't been able to create the great collaborative novel. And you would think that we would be able to take a leaf from uh, the book of one of the most successful crowd-powered systems on the web, like Wikipedia, and apply it to creative uh, collaboration online. 
but a completely open collaborative system can make it hard for a group to decide on and adhere to a single creative vision. On the other hand, in highly structured approaches, participants might build up a story piece by piece by adding a few sentences at a time. But without the ability to coordinate at a higher level, um, collaborators end up with incoherent patchwork stories that uh, turn out more like wild improv games than a novel. So what can we do about this? From past research on how creativity works, we know that one thing that we can do is make use of constraints to limit and direct the search through a creative space for a story. Um, so with constraints, uh, creative work can be made more manageable uh, by reducing the space of possible choices, and this also makes sure that all the people working on the story are brainstorming in the same areas of that space. So in addition, rather than following some kind of a linear process, we also know that expert writers structure their writing around goals that they create and revise as they work. So what if we adopted these perspectives on using goals and creative constraints by putting leaders in charge of creating goals to direct work on the story and putting collaborators, potentially the crowd, in charge of fleshing out the story with those goals in mind? So based on this, we decided to explore potential online collaborative storytelling strategies uh, by building a tool ensemble based on the hypothesis that uh, the crowd and the individual have complementary creative strengths. So, uh, so to this end, we built a platform um, where individual leaders start a story by creating initial structures for stories uh, using mini writing prompts, which is the, where the idea of constraints comes in. Collaborators can then focus on the type of work that they're good at around these constraints, brainstorming, proposing possible segments of writing, or discussing potential solutions. The leader can then uh, do things like choose a winning contribution or merge or edit existing contributions to better fit the overall vision for the story. So using this platform, the main question that we wanted to ask was whether or not this division of creative responsibility would produce successful collaborations. Um, so in particular, could the crowd support the writing process for this lead author? Um, and to look at this question, we ran a month-long story writing competition we ran in collaboration with the creative writing department here, uh, where over 100 volunteer users from the web started almost 50 stories together, or over 50 stories together. Um, out of these, 20 were completed and submitted as entries into the competition. And so for this study, um, team sizes were fairly small with a median of two people working on each story. We provided a prompt asking teams to write a story about what happens to stolen bikes. And we got a number of uh, interesting stories, including a character study of a man who obsessively steals bikes due, uh, due to childhood trauma, uh, and a, uh, a story where bikes try to escape their bonds and oppressors and journey to bike heaven. And this was one example of the prompts that leaders created with this particular scene asking for details filling out the introduction to the story. Uh, so as you can see, contributors are conversing with the leader about these high-level story details. Uh, but in general, people would also use these comment spaces to point out low-level issues like uh, grammar and spelling errors or point out if they've made any changes to the story. So to, uh, to summarize our findings here, um, we found that on the leader side of things, leaders tended to maintain creative authority with half of their activity being spent revising paragraphs written themselves. Uh, so in practice, this meant that leaders were manually integrating uh, ideas provided by others and submitted paragraphs or comments uh, into the story rather than taking contributions as is. So uh, in other words, leaders were interpreting contributions for the high level idea being suggested and using them as examples or points of comparison um, while manually tweaking existing work. Contributors, on the other hand, were limited to writing comments or paragraphs in uh, response to any prompts that were provided by the leader. So when they submitted, uh, when they submitted paragraphs for a story, they were able to do so without overwriting um, other people's proposals for uh, that section. And because of this, contributors could use this as a safe way to show rather than describe their ideas for the story. So as one participant put it, it was harder for them to describe uh, what they wanted to do rather than to just do it. So in this way, and um, somewhat unexpectedly, this feature that we had built to, um, that was meant to facilitate low-level merging of writing work was actually used uh, instead as a way to clearly communicate high-level ideas. Um, so to sum up, we saw that leaders played this role of merging work to, uh, in order to make it possible for contributions to add to each other rather than having to compete against each other as in traditional crowdsourcing workflows. 
So um, here, since we saw that Ensemble worked with smaller groups, um, our next question was to ask whether we could achieve a similar collaboration with larger teams. So that thought sparked the creation of the next project I'm going to talk about, Mechanical Novel. Uh, so here, rather than using leaders to guide uh, collaborative work around constraints, we looked at how we could get crowds to take on that leader role for themselves while writing short fiction stories. So for Ensemble, a major bottleneck was uh, this leader who had to coordinate contributions. Um, looking at everything coming in was a huge burden on one person, and leaders told us that coming up with constraints was sometimes difficult for them. So the question with Mechanical Novel was, uh, how can we get crowds to monitor their own progress and uh, adjust their work accordingly? So like I mentioned earlier, existing crowdsourcing systems usually break down complex tasks by splitting them into independent parts that you can piece together later, or by using a workflow to build on a task step by step. However, this means that uh, these systems can't crowdsource work that has mutually interdependent parts. So for something like a story, uh, changing the name of a character, for example, requires you to have to go through and change all mentions of this character elsewhere. And this gets even more complex if you start changing more abstract things like a character's motivation. So already it's pretty clear that what an expert creator like an author does uh, to make these types of changes isn't what crowdsourcing systems can currently do. Instead, when experts make these kinds of changes, they use reflection to engage in a sort of conversation with their work. So when they reflect, they continually evaluate whether they like where they're going and whether uh, it's getting them closer to their vision, which itself might still be forming in their head. So rather than using a static workflow to create, experts use reflection to determine if they need to make changes and what their next step should be. So what would it look like for uh, a crowd to collaboratively reflect on their work? Instead of developing a static workflow to accomplish the static goal, we could break down complex work by reflecting on and revising high-level goals. So to do this, uh, the crowd can loop between two phases. First, they reflect on the work so far to brainstorm and choose a high-level goal to pursue next. And then they revise the work by decomposing that goal into small actionable tasks that guide what edits workers should make. So to explore this technique, uh, we created a system called Mechanical Novel for writing purely crowdsourced short fiction stories hooked into Mechanical Turk. The crowd starts by creating a first draft in response to a story prompt. Um, so this first draft, draft is usually not super great, but it allows the crowd to set an initial rough direction for a story's idea. So here we start off with a story prompt, the hot air balloon, where um, a boy accidentally flies to a city in the sky. Uh, and the crowd writes a short story uh, one paragraph at a time and uses votes to pick the best uh, text for each section. Next, the, clou the, cloud, the crowd starts to reflect. Um, to do this, we ask workers to critique the story uh, using a simple feedback structure where the worker writes something that they liked, something they wished was different, and a speculative what if that offers a possible change the story could make next. Oops. Uh, we use these generated what ifs as candidates for the crowd's next goal for the story. So here workers have offered a few different changes like what if we could learn a little bit more about Malcolm, or what if we could expand the ending so that Malcolm gets to explore the, clou the cloud city. And the crowd then votes to select one of these options as the main high-level goal for work. So let's say the crowd votes to expand the story's ending so that Malcolm can explore the cloud city. Oops. Oh, okay. The crowd then starts their revise phase. So after picking this high-level goal, uh, the crowd votes for which sections of the story need to change in order to achieve this goal along with specific suggestions for what those changes should be. So um, here the crowd makes a few votes indicating that uh, maybe most workers think that the last paragraph is the one that needs to change in order to achieve the goal of expanding the ending. And some options workers have written for expanding the ending is to have Malcolm exit the balloon and explore, or maybe to write in a villain that Malcolm has to defeat before he can leave. So workers then vote among these suggestions. So uh, let's say that workers think that Malcolm should get out of the hot air balloon to lick around. 
The suggestions that get the most votes become microtasks that ask workers to edit the text for a particular section um, by acting as specific instructions for how a section should change. So at this step, workers see a request to incorporate Malcolm getting out of the hot air balloon into this paragraph. Um, when, once edits are made and workers vote for the best version of edits, uh, this ends the revision phase of work. And that completes one round of reflection and revision. Um, the process that uh, can then repeat, allowing the crowd to choose a new goal and revise the story again, this time tackling perhaps a different problem. So in this way, the crowd is able to determine a high-level goal for themselves, which becomes a measuring stick against which all workers can see if their contributions are doing the right thing and fitting in with other people's work, all without the need for a core leader that coordinates everything. So with this system, our hypothesis was that allowing the crowd to revise their goals as they generate creative work will result in better creative outcomes that, uh, than approaches that do not allow for reflection. So to look at this, I ran two studies. Uh, the first was a benchmark evaluation to see whether a mechanical novel would be able to detect and fix problems that we artificially introduced into a short story. The second study was to see if mechanical novel would be able to write a short story from scratch and to look at the quality of the stories that get written. Both of these studies had two experimental conditions. Uh, the me mechanical novel condition, which used the system that I just described, uh, and the control condition, which represented a typical crowdsourcing workflow, uh, where workers jump straight into voting for how to edit a story and making edits um, and skip the part where they choose a high-level goal. Uh, and workers who participated in these studies were randomly assigned to participate in one of these conditions. So first, the benchmark study. Um, so with this, we wanted to get a sense of mechanical novels' strengths and weaknesses and see if it was something that we wanted to move forward with. So we started out with a short story written by Sarah, who's a master's student working on the mechanical novel project and also a really good writer. Um, she chose six common types of story problems, ranging from low-level things like adding typos and grammar um, to high-level things like adding unnecessary characters. And using the original story as a base, uh, she then wrote six new stories, each introducing one of these six problems. Um, and so this gave us sort of a gold standard to work from, as we knew exactly where and what the major problems were for each story and how we'd expect someone to fix them. We then ran Mechanical Novel and the Control System over each of these 12 stories for uh, just one revision round. And then we repeated all of that three times. Um, Lastly, we looked, we looked at workers' votes for which paragraphs to edit, as well as uh, the actual edits that they made to paragraphs to determine how often crowd workers were able to detect the problem present in the story, as well as how often crowd workers were able to fix the problem. Um, and so for this, just to highlight some of the, more, uh, the most interesting findings from this, we found that mechanical novel was more likely to um, correctly identify the problematic story sections for the abrupt ending problem and um, extra characters problem, while the control condition was better at detecting lower level issues like typos. Um, both were equally good at detecting and fixing sudden changes in the narrator's point of view. Uh, and these findings carried over to each system's strengths in fixing certain problems as well, uh, as mechanical novel uh, workers seemed to be better at uh, fixing the abrupt ending. Um, and even though both systems were able to detect out of character dialogue, mechanical novel was better at fixing this issue. So already we can sort of see a trend towards mechanical novel being strong at addressing these high-level problems with story, uh, with plot, and with character, while the control system predictably seemed to be uh, better at addressing lower-level technical issues like spelling and grammar. So seeing how mechanical novel might uh, uh, how it might differ from traditional crowdsourcing workflows seemed promising, so we wanted to see how mechanical novel would perform in writing a story from scratch. So to do this, we came up with five story prompts, ranging a variety of topics. Uh, and from these, the crowd generated a first draft for each story, containing about six short scenes of text. Um, we then duplicated these first drafts so that the stories in the control condition and in the mechanical novel condition started from the same base text. Uh, we then ran each story through five rounds of revisions, again with mechanical novel starting out with this critique, um, and with the control condition skipping, straight, uh, skipping the critique and jumping straight into choosing which sections of the story to edit. 
So in addition, uh, workers in both conditions who participated in revising the story text were optionally allowed to fill out a short feedback form to indicate what they thought was difficult or easy about making edits. Uh, and once stories were written, um, to evaluate stories for quality, we asked 215 Mechanical Turk workers who had not worked on any of the story writing tasks to compare the Control and Mechanical Turk versions for one of the story prompts. Uh, and we asked Turkers here to choose which story they thought was better in terms of several dimensions. So, um, for example, which story has better imagery, which story has better story structure, and so on. Um, and finally, we did an analysis of all story edits, uh, critiques made, how tasks were decomposed, as well as feedback that we received from workers to look for themes in uh, what workers saw as problems and how they attempted to fix these problems. So in the end, over 400 Mechanical Turk tasks later uh, and 200 unique workers later, we ended up with 10 stories, five revised by the control condition and five revised by Mechanical Novel. Uh, stories took about 11 days to go through five rounds of revision on average. Um, and again, these were short stories, um, with stories being about 600 to 1,000 words long. Um, and overall, we did find that uh, our readers liked stories written by mechanical novel better. Um, to unpack this, we found several interesting differences between the mechanical novel and control stories. So first, we found that mechanical novel stories had significantly more developed plots. Um, readers rated mechanical novel stories as having more complete story arcs with clearer beginning, middles, and ends. Um, readers also rated mechanical novel stories as having more um, original and interesting central story ideas, which is interesting considering the fact that um, both the mechanical novel and control stories started from the same base uh, first draft. Uh, and the blue elephant story that uh, crowd workers wrote is a good example of how a mechanical novel was able to create a better story arc. So in the original story, a young girl realizes her stuffed elephant is gone. She looks all over for it and um, in the end is reunited with it and finds that it has come to life. In the control version, um, workers attempted to motivate the main character's search uh, by briefly describing her relationship with the elephant um, and also tried to add in a reason for the elephant's disappearance. Um, so an improvement, um, but could be better. The mechanical novel version, in contrast, uh, started with a description of how Kaylee received the elephant from her grandmother, which was the same doll her recently deceased mother had when she was a little girl. Um, workers also tied this idea uh, into the ending, which reveals that Kaylee's love for her grandmother was what brought the blue elephant to life in the end, um, creating the specific theme that kind of threads through the whole story and brings it together. Second, we found that mechanical novel seems to focus workers' efforts towards improving the narrative. Um, so it seemed that uh, in workers in the control condition actually spent more of their effort fixing spelling and grammar compared to mechanical novel workers. But in contrast, mechanical novel stories were rated as having better imagery and description and writing style. So this, uh, and this focus on fleshing out the story itself was also corroborated by the analysis we did um, of types of edits that workers made to each story, where we found that workers in the mechanical novel condition made significantly more edits that expanded uh, on describing characters, while workers in the control condition uh, trended towards making more edits related to, again, fixing grammar and spelling. So for example, in this, uh, the control version of the John Doe, John Doe story, which is a story about a man who finds himself in heaven, um, started out like this, a very a uh, straightforward description of the main character's surroundings. The mechanical novel story, however, uses first-person voice to narrate the main character's findings, uh, thoughts and feelings as they try to process an unfamiliar pl uh, place. Lastly, we found that mechanical novel allowed workers to coordinate their creative efforts. Um, after analyzing the feedback that workers wrote after writing or revising story text, we found that mechanical novel workers often justified their work by saying that they were following the suggestions established by other workers, meaning that workers were, uh, they were working with others to achieve this high level goal. Um, workers in the control condition, on the other hand, were more uh, trended towards making edits that were more likely to um, try and focus the story's direction themselves. Um, and they were more likely to try and justify their work by critiquing the story as a whole. 
So by this time, you're probably curious as to what one of these stories actually looked like. So I'll walk through the control and mechanical novel version of one of the stories workers wrote during uh, the study. So um, this particular story is about, uh, is I guess like a film noir type story titled Number 16, and it was about a serial killer whose target suddenly disappears. So this initial first draft of the story, as you might expect, was filled with inconsistencies. The very first paragraph starts out with a major plot twist where the 2B victim actually catches the main character following her and points a gun at him. But the next par paragraph continues as if that hadn't happened, describing the serial killer as waiting patiently to make his next move. And later on in the story, the point of view changes from the serial killer to the victim, suddenly drawing from the plot twist idea earlier in the story and starts narrating the, the victim's thoughts as she tries to hunt down the serial killer instead. But then the story ends with the serial killer maybe killing the victim. It's not clear, and that's how it ends. So in the control version of the story, workers were able to remove this early plot twist uh, and change the ending so that the victim does turn the tables on the serial killer. But by fixing these issues, they ended up removing much of the story arc, including that kind of important plot twist that acted as foreshadowing for that for that ending, um, resulting in kind of a monotone plot and an ending that seems kind of random. In contrast, the mechanical novel version of the story, like the control version, um, changes the ending so that the tables are turned on the killer, but also removes, um, well, rather than removing the plot twist, the early plot twist altogether, transforms it into um, kind of a foreshadowing for later parts of the plot. So instead of the victim catching the serial killer following her, she actually kind of bumps into him um, and asks him if like, oh, like, are you okay? Or do you need anything? And he's like, oh no, I'm fine. And um, she acts oblivious. Um, whereas later on you find out that she actually knew everything that was happening. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, in addition, mechanical novel workers also added backstories for the serial killer and the victim to explain why they're doing what they're doing in the story. Um, just another example of how mechanical novels seem to focus more on expanding characters. So in summary, we found that workers in the mechanical novel condition uh, focused on higher level story problems uh, than workers in the control condition and were less likely to try and hijack the direction of the story when contributing work. Uh, workers were able to select uh, reasonable high level goals for themselves and use these goals to break down the task of revising a short story into coordinated actions. So the last project I'm going to talk about is Mosaic. So where uh, Ensemble and Mechanical Novel specifically looked at translating a certain expert creative practice for use in crowd work, uh, with Mosaic, I wanted to look at expert mindsets. Um, failure, struggle, unexpected setbacks, and new inspirations are all part of creative work. So how can we encourage this in the design of social systems for creators? So to set the stage for where this idea is coming from, um, online creative communities today, like DeviantArt, Pixiv, and Dribbble, focus on showcasing completed work, creating a climate where creators uh, aim to produce work that is as impressive as possible to attract viewers and fans. Um, and this is a great opportunity to get feedback from others and to look at examples of other people's really cool work. Uh, and creators do try to capitalize this in a lot of ways. Sometimes they carve out social spaces for sharing in-progress work, they'll create and curate tutorials, uh, or organize events specifically for tackling creative challenges. And this makes sense because uh, we already know from past literature on creativity that improving skills uh, centers around continually assessing one, one's creative process based on feedback and exploratory experiments. So obviously many creators already know this, which is why they try to foster these activities based around creative process. But despite these efforts to help each other in development and growth, uh, creators find themselves having to compete against impressive finished work when uploading earlier unfinished work to explain their processes processes to each other, which may discourage people from participating in these activities. But what if creative communities were designed from the get-go to allow creators to share a creative process as first-class content? Rather than just sharing finished work, creators could share in-progress snapshots of work to illustrate what they did and why. So by uh, designing a social environment that rewards sharing early work, we may create better opportunities for creators to not only learn specific techniques from each other, but also enable them to reflect more effectively on their own work and on others' work. 
So to get a sense of how a community like this might compare against existing art communities, um, I first interviewed 10 artists about the art communities that they already use to share their work. Um, and overall, interviewees said that they do uh, mainly use existing sites like DeviantArt, Facebook, and Tumblr to share their uh, artwork for the purpose of getting as much exposure as they can. And while they have, and while many of them um, have posted works in progress on these sites in the past, um, these were mainly to serve uh, mostly a social purpose, kind of like a "Hey, here's what I'm up to. Here's kind of a sneak peek at what I what I do," um, kind of thing. And the reason is because. Uh, uh, there are many technical or social barriers that they have to uh, face when trying to share their process, such as having to go through a tedious process of concatenating a bunch of pictures into a single image, or being seen as spammy for posting too many pictures of the same artwork at different stages, preventing them from posting substantial content more often. So with the barriers that these artists mentioned in mind, um, I designed and launched Mosaic, uh, an online social art platform where the primary method of sharing artwork is to upload multiple images illustrating the creative process, the steps that an artist uh, takes to create a piece of artwork. So for example, um, just to kind of walk through how it works, say we have a Mosaic user named Cookie Cat who just started a still life oil painting of their favorite dessert. So they might create a work in progress representing their first step, which is drawing a sketch. Uh, and this work in progress on Mosaic would include a description of any reasoning behind their steps, such as why they chose a certain type of subject matter or how they chose a certain visual composition. Related works in progress are uh, grouped together in a project, which represents a single creative work. So um, Cookie Cat might create a project representing their still life cookie painting, uh, adding works in progress representing stages of development of their artwork, from sketch to underpainting, maybe to blocking in colors, and so on. Other social features on Mosaic enable artists to view what others are doing. So the homepage consists of a feed of recent activity and shows comments, new projects, and new updates to existing projects. You can also search for projects by keyword or even by specific type of work in progress. And all of this put together allows creators to focus on sharing knowledge with each other. So say we have another user named Donut Dog who happens to see that Cookie Cat has recently added an update to a painting um, very similar to the kind of painting that Donut Dog wants to make. And so they click to take a look. Uh, and Donut Dog is surprised by Cookie Cat's use of an underpainting to kind of black out shadows and light early in the process, which is a technique that um, they're not as familiar with. So Donut Dog favorites this project to subscribe to this project's updates in the future and leaves a comment thanking Cookie Cat for teaching something new. So in this way, by centering users' interactions around sharing process, Mosaic is able to unlock a number of useful interactions between creators, such as uh, including being able to compare your own creative process with others, learn new techniques, and provide feedback in a specific, timely way. So uh, my hypothesis with Mosaic was that uh, sharing creative processes is difficult for creators because existing creative communities are designed to reward sharing high quality creative outcomes. So instead, an alternative design for a community designed around sharing works in progress may encourage creators to share early work and learn from each other. So uh, in order to understand the difficulties artists face when seeking or sharing works in progress online, uh, we conducted a field deployment of Mosaic over the course of four weeks. Uh, and invited users from uh, artists from hobbyist art communities to use Mosaic to host snapshots of works in progress, uh, work, snapshots of work in progresses of whatever they happen to be working on. And during the study period, we logged all community activity, including the creation of projects, work in progress snapshots, project favorites, user follows, and so on. Uh, and finally, at the end of the study period, we conducted semi-structured interviews with 10 of the most active Mosaic users, uh, as measured by their commenting and project posting activity, to understand whether posting works in progress affected their creative practice and how they interacted with other Mosaic users. So by the end of the study period, uh, a total of 46 users created 69 projects, with projects containing an average of about five works in progress each, and uh, each re receiving an average of about two comments. And there's an interesting range in the types of images that people would upload. Um, so while many people uploaded a typical step-by-step -step set of images, like in this example, um, others would post work of their uh, 
uh, post photos of their work environment and tools, uh, or include maybe initial exploratory sketches that weren't ultimately used. Uh, and speaking with interview, uh, interview participants, we did find that Mosaic um, seemed to provide a significantly different experience from existing art communities that they frequent. Um, so first, participants described posting about their process as a useful way for them to reflect on their own work. Um, so a few artists, including uh, this participant, pointed out that documenting their process on Mosaic would be useful to their future selves to help them remember that uh, th this beautiful painting that they're so proud of actually did start out kind of horrible, so they don't feel bad about a horrible start to a new project. Secondly, works in progress on Mosaic seem to allow other creators to pinpoint uh, the intent of the creator posting artwork, leading to uh, informed feedback from the community as a whole. Um, participants found this useful as this meant that they could use other users' comments as a mirror to kind of help them reflect on whether or not they were able to achieve their goals. Uh, posting works in progress also implicitly enforced uh, kind of a community of re reciprocity. Um, so many artists like this participant mentioned that a principle of fairness or a desire to give back to the community drove their motivation to create tutorials or write feedback for others. But enforcing this uh, fairness can be quite difficult on existing sites like DeviantArt. Um, in contrast, many participants describe uh, both posting works in progress and posting comments for others as kind of teaching opportunities on Mosaic. So in other words, creators uh, ended up framing the, uh, their Mosaic projects that they uploaded as kind of gifts of knowledge to others, and this was the same mechanism through which people received feedback and help. And lastly, we found that Mosaic allowed uh, artists to feel less apprehensive about sharing their work. Um, so on existing sites, the goal is to compete with others for views and comments. Um, but in contrast, Mosaic-centered user activity around making updates uh, on progress of artwork, creating an environment where sharing process was something that everybody was doing, um, and making people focus less on the final outcome and more on sharing a journey. So in summary, Mosaic demonstrates some of the benefits uh, of designing creativity support tools and communities around outcomes other than traditional success, such as experimentation, exploration, or even failure. Um, these are all clearly important parts of the creative process, and creating such tools would uh, help expand the ways in which social systems and other technology can help support creators. So in this talk, I presented three projects, uh, Ensemble, Mechanical Novel, and Mosaic. Through this project, I explored how adapting existing, existing creative practices by experts can help us design new kinds of crowdsourcing workflows and social computing systems for accomplishing collaborative, open-ended creative tasks. Uh, these projects also touch on specific design patterns that came out of embedding expert practices into social systems. For example, using constraints to help collaborators, uh, collaborators strike a balance between free creativity and working in sync with others, uh, letting reflection drive collaborative action to allow crowds to work together flexibly, and aiming, to create, uh, aiming for uh, creating a social environment that embraces process rather than trying to act as a gallery. But more broadly, my work's uh, major contribution to the field of HCI uh, is creating crowdsourcing and social computing systems that focus on supporting a creator's process. So through Ensemble Mechanical Novel, I developed a technique for extracting strategies from expert practice um, and embedding them into the design of collaborative tools for accomplishing complex creative work with crowds. Uh, in all of my projects, I contributed working proof-of-concept social systems and crowdsourcing workflows to show that an expert practice uh, can be incorporated with the design of a system to improve the quality of creative outcomes. And through Mosaic, I expanded the possible space of creativity support tools to um, include tools that value process and not just final outcome, um, specifically proposing design affordances like sharing the process behind artwork instead of just the uh, steering the process behind artwork and show how this affects interactions between creators in an online community. 
And these contributions open up a number of interesting avenues for future work. Um, first, we could explore other designs for crowdsourcing systems that allow crowd workers to direct their own work. So uh, for example, orienting uh, work around high level goals like we did in Mechanical Novel um, may be great in early stages of writing a story when ideas are still developing. Uh, but la in later stages, when you might want to actually focus on cleaning up spelling and grammar and um, fixing sentences that don't flow well, uh, a more traditional crowdsourcing system may actually be actually be more helpful. So it would be interesting to see if a crowdsourcing system um, could dynamically adjust the degree to which it focused on high level or low level work and see how that affects the creative output of the crowd. Secondly, um, a major area of research has drawn on the fact that uh, the crowd is physically spread in many different locations. So um, Rather than maybe re relying on ad hoc behavior or um, some sort of central governing figure, um, we might be able to use the strategies that uh, we saw in Mechanical Novel to self-organize, for example, maybe citizen reporting efforts or humanitarian efforts um, in cases of like a natural disaster when um, central di direction isn't readily available. And lastly, we could expand uh, the design direction we explored with Mosaic um, and perhaps generate a new design space uh, of creativity support tools and communities designed around sharing process. So Mosaic was just kind of the tip of the iceberg there. Um, you could add on to this direction by thinking about a community that allows creators to uh, maybe curate techniques into personal toolboxes or libraries or imagine communities where people explicitly showcase failures instead of focusing on success. Um, thinking beyond just traditional success um, opens opportunities for new ways that creators could help support each other. Okay, so just before I wrap things up, I want to thank you all for listening. Um, I also want to thank a lot of other people as well. Um, first and foremost, my advisor, Michael Bernstein, um, who's been a great source of support for me, not uh, only in times where uh, I wanted to give up on projects that didn't seem like they were going anywhere, but um, also making sure that I remembered to celebrate my victories as well um, and never letting me forget that, yeah, I did do some pretty cool stuff during my PhD. Um, I also want to thank my committee, um, Manish, Mira, Pam, and James um, for taking their time out of their busy schedules to be here. Um, you know, some of you have known longer than others, but all of you have been very kind and encouraging and wonderful mentors to me. Um, I've also had the opportunity to work with some of the most smart and dedicated, hardworking people I know um, during my time here. Um, I also want to thank all my friends uh, uh, in the office and everyone else that I've met here while at Stanford, especially the best office mates in the world, um, Nilafar, Lydia, Ali, and Danai. Um, thanks also to our admins, um, Jillian and Monica, for uh, keeping me and everyone else fed through our weekly lunches and also not getting mad at me for emailing them a billion Mechanical Turk receipts. <laughs> uh, and lastly, much love to my parents and to my sisters who um, didn't really know what I was doing here, but believed I was doing a good job at it, whatever it was. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's it for my talk. I'm happy to take questions now, or if you prefer, you can contact me by email. Thanks. Floor is open. Yeah. Hi, that was great. Um, I have a very general question, so I'm I'm not familiar with crowdsourcing. Mm -hmm. How, who are these? What are the demographics like of these talkers? Like, do they have jobs? How educated are they? Um, where are they from? And and how is the crowdsourcing like? landscape growing. It, it, is a mechanical tech, for example, growing in a number of users, or is crowdsourcing like dying out or something? <laughs> hmm. Those are deep questions. Um, as for the demographics, uh, there has been, uh, I should be familiar with this, there has been research on like explicitly figuring out who these people are. Um, uh, for, uh, for my projects, I focus specifically on um, uh, uh, crowd workers um, from the United States, um, though I think there's a pretty huge range of, like, these aren't just like, there's a pretty huge range of people on Mechanical Turk. A lot of them have other jobs, a lot of them are stay-at-home people who do stuff in spare time. Um, some people do it for fun, some people do it to like make a little extra income. Um, so it, there's a really big range of motivations and type of people who are on there. Uh, I think um, for the most part, uh, people tend to, uh, uh, 
uh, view Mechanical Turk as, like, uh, in general, the kind of assumption is that Mechanical Turk workers tend to be um, not trained in very specific things. And so they're kind of like a, um, a general non-expert, I guess we would say, um, to use. Like, they're, cause, uh, in contrast, there's other research that um, looks at crowdsourcing and um, using populations of expert workers, so uh, uh, recruiting people from Upwork or um, these other kinds of things where uh, you can, there are a lot of workers on there who are very specialized in certain kinds of things. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Great work. Awesome, awesome stuff, Joy. Thanks. As, as always. So I'm in interested uh, to hear your thoughts about sort of in terms of the mosaic project. So, you know, there's a, uh, you know, often on YouTube you'll find people have like time lapse videos mm -hmm. of them doing work or other things like that. How do you think something like that sort of time lapse approach versus this very structured, uh, or in some case, having more contextual information that they can provide mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the single images uh, changes the way that you are able to use that. Uh, obviously, it seems like you know you can look glance at it more quickly, but what are the other things? And have, did you think about other media or other ways that you could present some of these uh, types of sort of in-progress work? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so. Uh, uh, among the artists that I talked to, these sort of um, video recordings of, of artwork are very popular, um, and they offer a lot of benefits. Being able to see somebody like create something stroke by stroke is also very informative. Um, the one thing is that um, we wanted to kind of get at, uh, th so these things are uploaded all at once. Like, there's no opportunity for someone to kind of jump in and be like, oh, hey, like, at minute 30, like, you drew this hand wrong or, or something like that. Like, there's no opportunity for that kind of um, two-way interaction there. It's, all, it's a very one-way thing where an artist draws something, they record it, they upload it, and that's it. Like, it's sort of pushed out into the world and be like, okay, learn from me. That's cool. Um, so uh, it's useful, but we wanted to get a kind of this, what would the sort of two-way interaction look like if you could post work as you were working on it and get input um, from a community right away? Um, yeah, and so, uh, but we do, um, thinking about how that sort of thing could fit into Mosaic, um, some of the artists that we talked to um, thought it would be really cool to be able to, like, instead of just post images, like maybe post video clips for each step or something like that, um, or um, being able to link to uh, a live stream that they were working on. So if they uploaded a project on Mosaic and then they happen to be currently working on it and live streaming, they it'd be cool. Um, one of them said it would be cool to be able to like flip that flag and be like, oh hey, I'm working on this project right now. Come here, Mosaic users. Like I'm I'm looking at I'm I'm doing this right now. And so um, so they had a lot of ideas for how we could kind of plug in this this sort of thing into their kind of existing practices. And there seems to be a lot of opportunity there. Yeah. Um. For mechanical novel, do you have any idea on like what the effects of like, the additional structure is on like motivation, enjoyment, and learning compared to like the just like less structured writing? Motivation, enjoyment, and learning. Hmm. Um. Could you say more about what you're interested in oh, like, asking? Uh, like uh, based on like qualitative feedback or anything of that sort that you may have received from like the people. Just like did they like working system? on it? Like the yeah, um, we did get a lot of comments that people found it very fun. Like, like we got a we got a bunch of comments like, "Oh yeah, this hit was great, better than a bunch of mindless clicking." And like, we had to actually like think about stuff. So I think they enjoyed um, that kind of thing um, to the point where, uh, and then again, this sort of ties into different people's motivation for being on Mechanical Turk. Like, some people spent way more time than they were probably supposed to um, on it because they enjoyed it so much. Um, and people like people would say things like, "Oh, I spent like 20 minutes on this, but I don't care. It was like really cool." Other people would be like, "Oh, I spent 20 minutes on this. Pay me for it." And we're like, "Oh, sorry." <laughs> um, so uh, it was a little bit hard to kind of gauge um, what people got out of it. Um, but in general, it did seem that people found it unique and interesting. Um, and um, I think the fact that uh, we were able to kind of, for the most part, fit these little creative tasks into a micro task kind of package, I think, was very well received. Um, oh gosh, uh, Sharon. <laughs> hey, a great talk. I'm, I'm actually really interested in mosaic, and I was wondering um, if you thought about maybe combining some of the feedback methods people used in ensemble with mosaic. Like mm -hmm. in ensemble, you allow people to write like alternative paragraphs mm -hmm. and. Do you think like the users of Mosaic are interested in like, 
drawing directly on yeah. images or yeah, um, that's actually, so um, that is a practice um, called redlining. Um, so people uh, do do this sometimes on um, like uh, some of the bigger like work in progress critique forums that, that already exist. Um, the thing is, it's, uh, I think that's definitely something that we could build into Mosaic because I think that would tie into like designing a community directly um, designed for that kind of thing, because currently to do this kind of redlining stuff, you have to download what the people uploaded, you have to like draw it yourself in Photoshop and like um, upload it back somewhere and hope that they see it or you post in the right thread or whatever. Um, so yeah, it would be interesting to kind of integrate that thing in into Mosaic, because it's definitely something that people like to see and want to do. Um, again, also probably because it's easier to kind of explain through doing it instead of trying to like translate into words. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's definitely something people would want. Um, yeah. Penny? I was actually more curious, how do you recruit artists for Mosaic, given that you can't just pick random mechanical surfers and the unit of them with field artists? Yeah, um, so, uh, so I'm plugged into a, um, a few art communities on there. So I, I um, kind of just uh, advertise in these art communities that I'm already plugged into um, and recruited people from there. Um, so it was a little bit easier considering that I, I like I was sort of, I wasn't just like a random person, like I was sort of like in that group already and so people were a bit um, open to trying this new thing out. Uh, how about you? Oh, yeah. okay. So uh, I was just thinking, because of the structure of mechanical novel, um, do you think it's a good platform to develop like dynamic storyline? Like mm -hmm. uh, kind of a throwback to uh, Choose Your Own Adventure, books <laughs> that I used to read as a kid. So now that you have people who are willing to sort of write off parts of the story, so let's say you hit a junction in the story, like you could have a group of people work on this part, another group of people work on this part, and so if you were to publish a story, you kind of have an uh, interesting model because you don't no longer have it published in a physical form, and so people could sort of read the story differently every time. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, so we definitely did thought of, think about doing that um, at first, um, even way back with Ensemble. Um, uh, and there are there are other research projects out there that have kind of explored this like um, hypermedia approach of like people branching out and um, you know seeing whether how it affects how people collaborate or how people feel about their contributions to like a branding story versus like just a um, one with no branching. Um, for us, we decided uh, not to pursue that route just because um, I think the issue for that well I found interesting was that. Um, how do people resolve differences in opinion about what the central storyline should be? So I think branching would, I think, uh, would be interesting to explore, but not answer that question. So that's, that's kind of why we went with that uh, research direction. We have time for one more question. Oh, okay. Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, so much pressure. Uh, <laughs> um, I really like all three projects. I was wondering from Mechanical Novel if uh, you noticed any significant impact of the number of people working on the project um, to the quality of the outcome. What I mean is, was it linear in, in, in that as you increase the number of people that were working on, on the, 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 the novel, mm -hmm. uh, the quality, the outcome got better, or was it that, was it more of a curve? Um, was it that there's a sweet spot, and then after which it just got too much, like too many chefs? Um, mm -hmm. Did you think about that, or do, what do you feel about that, rather? That would be interesting to look at. So we didn't, we didn't. That was not something that we manipulated in um, mechanical novel. But I think it would be interesting to look at. I, like uh, an interesting direction for future work more broadly, I think, would be um, looking at how to kind of model these sorts of things. Like you know, what effect does like the number of crowd workers have on the quality of creative output? Or like you can think about turning other kinds of knobs and levers to figure that out. Um, uh, from my just my gut sense. You know, yeah, I'm. I'm not really sure. I think we'd have to like do it and like see. Um, it, it is kind of interesting because we did get um, some workers, especially in the blue elephant story, where it was about a girl uh, who lost her stuffed animal. Um, a lot of people wrote about their personal experiences, like as a kid, which I thought was kind of interesting. So it'd be interesting to see how much that affected the story um, or not. Uh, yeah, good question. 